Our scripture reading this morning, we begin with our theme verse, which is Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Colossians 1.13-17. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The scripture text is Luke 11. 14 through 23. And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Others, to test him, were demanding of him a sign from heaven. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul, and if I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? So they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. Maybe see. Welcome. It's really good to be back. It's always, I guess, nice to take a little break from the responsibility of preparing a message every week, but not from the, the, um, the blessing of being able to be in the Word to the point of when you're studying for a message and being able to share that with you guys. So I am really excited to be back, and I'm looking forward to it, and looking forward to see what God's going to bring out of this message for all of us. So let's open in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you we get to be here this morning, be a part of your church. Thank you for the work that you're doing in your church across this planet. I thank you for the work that you're doing in this church here in North Idaho. Lord, I thank you that you've involved each one of us. Lord, I pray that we, as we seek to grow closer to you, um, we are doing the part in the church that you've called us to do as individuals, to serve in the church. And, and as we heard this morning, to see the joy of what it looks like and what it means to be a part of serving you and doing your work and serving one another. Uh, Lord, I thank you for your word and that we get to be in it this morning. I thank you that we have your complete word. I pray we would take it seriously, let it uh, not just be knowledge in our heads, but go to our hearts that we might be convicted and challenged and encouraged and grow from it 
and encourage and challenge one another to be growing as well. I just thank you for this time this morning, and your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, so how many of you, I want to raise a hands, have had the, the privilege of experiencing an RV at the dump station? Okay. Okay, I, how many of you who have raised your hand have experienced an incident? Whether it was you or someone else has experienced an incident at the dump station, raise your hand. Okay. Well, we've only had a, a, a travel trailer for two years now. And uh, it's been, a, you know, I've gone to the dump station a few times. I, I've got it down pretty well. But not, not everyone's got it down well or very experienced at it. And you've got to remember that when you're at the dump station and you're waiting in line. So there we are. It's after the church camp out. We stop at the uh, fairgrounds dump station. Some of you else probably did, but I didn't see any of you there. And so you missed out. And so there I am. We're waiting in line. Thankfully, there's a playground nearby because the people in front of us are taking a very long time. Can you tell they've probably not done this before? So we're waiting. Kids are playing at the playground, so they didn't experience any of this. And so the people in front of they finally finish. I'm like, whew, okay. They pull out. We pull in. Well, just as we pull in, another rig had pulled in because it's an island-type dump station. People are dumping on both sides. And you're not far from the person dumping next to you. And so right as I pull up, I'm getting my hoses out. I'm getting ready. The people beside me, they're just a little ahead. They're getting hooked up. And, and I'm subconsciously hearing what's going on, but not really paying any attention. And yeah, what it was is one guy was teaching some other guys how to do it. Okay, we'll pull the lever for the black tank first, which is the right way to do it. And I hear spillage. And then I hear, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. So they turn it off, and I look over, and I'm like backing up because... <laughs> There's sewage spilling all over the ground. And what it was is they didn't get the fitting on all the way. They put it on and they turned it and it's got these little lock deals, but they didn't get all the tabs. So the under tab was not hooked and there was a big gap under there and it was leaking all over the place. Christianity is like an RV sewer connection. You either got it on all the way or you don't have it on. <laughs> And you got a mess on your hands. <laughs> Jesus said, He who is not with me is against me. And that's what we're looking at this morning. Funny illustration to try to help make sense of that. But let's get into the Word. We're in Luke chapter 11. We'll be starting at verse 14, going on through verse 23. So up to this point, we are about at least two and a half years into Jesus' three-year ministry. We're only a few months away from Jesus going to the cross. For that first two and a half years, Jesus spent most of his time ministering in Galilee. And now Jesus is down in the Judean area, the southern area, working his way towards Jerusalem. Luke has told us that he has set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem, which means he is determined because he knows there's something that needs to happen there. He's got a job to do, what he was sent to do. So, the context of this is Jesus is teaching throughout Judea as he is going from village to village. It wasn't a direct route straight to Jerusalem, but he is working his way there. Just before we, we left on our trip to Kentucky, I just did two messages on prayer. So Jesus had just taught on prayer. And now we get to this one. And this doesn't necessarily, verse 14 doesn't necessarily fall in an exact consecutive order. Luke doesn't, doesn't word it in that way, although it doesn't give us any reason to believe that it doesn't. But you're going to find that there is, if you, if you have good cross-references in your Bible, you're going to find that this is 
this story is also in Matthew and Mark. Now, I don't believe that they're the exact same story because the story of Matthew and Mark take place in Galilee, and there's some subtle differences. And I think you'll find there's a number of times in the Gospels that you'll see a mention of what sounds like two similar stories or two similar teachings of Jesus. But I don't think that necessarily means that they need to try to be the same story. Jesus would have encountered many of the same issues, many of the same problems, and would have taught many of the same things throughout. So we see a little bit of what looks like repetition. So, But we will reference the one in Matthew because I think it sheds a little bit of light on what might have also been going on here. So we'll be looking at that as a possibility of what also was going on here. So verse 14 starts out with, And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So we have numerous times up to this point that we have seen Jesus performing miracles, healing, casting out demons, and preaching the kingdom of God. And so... <coughs> We get to this, and we kind of don't think much of it. In fact, Jesus has performed so many miracles, there's times where it's just mentioned that, and he did numerous miracles and numerous healings, where they're not even all spelled out. And so it's not uncommon to us to see, and he was casting out a demon, but this was no common thing to be able to do. He says, and it was mute, in that the, the demon made the man mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds were amazed. Sounds like a similar story that we've seen at other times throughout Jesus' ministry. And then we get to verse 15. So the crowds were amazed. In fact, it was spectacular what Jesus was doing. But some of them said... And they make this interesting accusation. Look at what they say. He cast out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Now this is an interesting accusation. So first off, Beelzebul. It's kind of self-explanatory in the text where it says that the ruler of the demons. Well, we can assume that what we're talking about here is Satan or the devil. And that's true. Beelzebul, though, was not just a regular old term or, or um, literal term for the devil, a proper name like we would say for Satan. This was a derogatory word. In other words, when you use the word Beelzebul to refer to Satan, it was intended to be derogatory. It had a very nasty meaning to it. And so when they say that Jesus is casting out demons by Beelzebul, they don't just mean that, well, maybe he's empowered by the devil. Are we sure? We're not sure. No, this is like rude and crude way of saying it. Beelzebul was a word that was derived from pagan idolatry. You can look into it and find some interesting information on it. I'm not going to dig into it too much. It was derived from Beelzebub, which is, means Lord of the Flies, which is interesting. It was a Philistine god, and the Jews had sort of adopted it, reconformed it, and it had turned into this derogatory meaning of name for Satan. And so when they say this to Jesus, this is like kicking dirt in his face, is essentially what's going on here. So it raises the question of who is doing this and why. Well, first off, we need to look at, before we even dig into that, is how Jesus' miracles validated him as Messiah. So that's really a lot of what the issue of what's going on here, I believe. And if you remember the story of John the Baptist is in prison, and he sends some of his disciples to Jesus to basically ask him, are you the one, or should we be looking for someone else? In other words, are you the Messiah? I understood you'd be the Messiah, but for now, some reason, John is questioning this. 
And so he sends his disciples out to find out for sure, believing he'll get a straight answer from Jesus. And the question gets asked this, and Jesus, rather than just giving them just a blatant answer, he basically has them hang around, and he performs a lot of signs and miracles. And in Luke 7.22, and this is a passage we covered some time ago, says, and he, sa and he answered and said to them, so this is to John's disciples, are going to report back to John. He says, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. In other words, all of what Jesus was doing was confirming or validating him as the Messiah. Well, this raised an issue because there were plenty of people who did not want him to be the Messiah. They rejected him as the Messiah. And so they have to explain it some other way because this stuff's really happening. So how is he doing it if he's not the Messiah and he's not from God? And so they give this answer that he's doing it by the power of Satan, essentially. If we turn back to Matthew chapter 12, we have a very similar story, but in a different setting. This was a man who was blind and mute, who had a demon cast out of him. So verse 22 of Matthew chapter 12 is where I'm going to start. I'm going to read through uh, three verses here. Then a demon-possessed man was blind and mute, was brought to Jesus, and he healed him, so that the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, This man cannot be the son of David, can he? Referring to him as being the Messiah from the line of David. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man cast out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. This sounds like a quite similar story. And Luke doesn't tell us here that it's the religious leaders. He just simply says, But some of them said. But I think we can safely guess that likely the religious leaders were doing this, this was them, or they were part of this. As we see, they were the ones that typically were rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. But why? Why, would, why, was, why were people so reluctant to accept Jesus as the Messiah? Verse 23, back in Matthew chapter 12, said, All the crowds were amazed and were saying, This man cannot be the son of David, can he? Because it validated him as the Messiah, like I said earlier. This validated him as the Messiah, and they were unwilling to accept this because Jesus confronted them. See, the thing is, is many of these religious leaders, the one that Jesus confronted, these men were not truly men of God. And Jesus, knowing their hearts, knew that and would confront them, and they didn't like it. They didn't like what Jesus had to say, and they didn't like the fact that he proved himself as the Messiah. But the crowds are going, well, but he's doing all this stuff. How is he doing this? Explain that. Well, he's doing it by the power of Satan. And they say this in quite the derogatory way. So we cast back in Luke chapter 11, verse 15, He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Others, verse 16, Others test him, others, excuse me, to test him, were demanding of him a sign from heaven. Demanding of him a sign from heaven. Now, wait a second. Is it just me, or did Jesus just perform a sign right in front of them? Right? So here Jesus is performing a miracle of casting out this demon right in front of their very eyes, and they're saying, no, we want a sign even greater than that. That's not enough. You know, Satan could probably pull that off. So prove to us that you are truly who you say you are. Give us a sign from heaven. Okay, well, let's use our imagination for a minute. 
Jesus, the creator of the universe, could do a lot, right? Not outside of God's will, though. So we've got to keep that in mind. Let's just say he, I don't know, makes the sun move in the sky, or, or makes stars fall out of the sky, or takes a mountain and just and moves it right in front of their very eyes. Is that the kind of thing they're looking for, you think? Now let me ask you a question. Do you think that would have convinced them? Do you think it would have convinced them? Well, let's look at an example of this. Because often we think that. You know, if God would just reveal himself to people on this planet, maybe they would be convinced. And they would believe him. It would convince all the atheists. Do you think that would work? I think we have lots of scriptural evidence that that wouldn't work. And I'm going to give just one of them for starters. This reminds me of the rich man and Lazarus. Luke 16 is where that's found. And in verses 27 through 31, I'm going to read. And leading up to this, the rich man dies. He goes to hell. And the Lazarus is in heaven beside Abraham. And the rich man is able to converse across a great chasm. And he's pleading with Abraham. It says, and he, and he said, so this is the rich man, Then I beg you, Father Abraham, if you can't help me, in other words, can you at least do this? I beg you that you send him to my father's house. That is Lazarus. Send Lazarus to my father's house. For I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. They'll be convinced, right? It'll be like a sign from heaven. They'll be convinced. But he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Think about the time of Noah and the corruption that was going on in the earth. Do you know that people living during the time of Noah, when this was going on and the earth was so corrupt that God chose to wipe the entire earth out except for eight people, that a number of those people could have and probably did know Adam and Eve personally? Think about that. That's the time frame overlap, but they weren't convinced. There should have been no question in their mind that God was the creator. But they didn't care because of sin. So Jesus knows that even a sign from heaven is not going to convince them. So he takes a different approach. <clears throat> so they ask for a sign from heaven. Verse 17. But he knew their thoughts. We see this multiple times throughout Scripture. Jesus knew the thoughts of men. He didn't need anyone else to tell him the thoughts of men. He knew this. And he knew what they were thinking. And he knew that the sign was not the answer. Sure, it might convince some people, but it wasn't going to save them. Going to bring them to repentance. So he knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. So what Jesus is doing, rather than going, oh, well, let me give you a sign and convince you, he's going, no, let's deal with the heart issue. Let's deal with the first thing that came up. The thing that, where they said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul. Let's deal with that one. And so he gives an example. He says, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. Now, when you first read this, maybe you're thinking like I do, and you think, wow, it kind of sounds like we're the state of our country's in right now. And I hope it doesn't get to that place of the, the fall part. Hopefully this is all able to get sorted out in, in time. But I think we have something even bigger going on here. We have, I mean, look, look at what Jesus is trying to Explain because he's being accused of casting out demons and performing all these miracles that he's doing by the power of Satan. So essentially what he's saying is like, what you guys are saying, if you're saying I'm doing this, then you're saying that I'm working against 
God's, Satan's plan. This doesn't make any sense because all Jesus did was do the will of the Father. Satan capable of doing the will of the Father? No, Satan's not capable of that unless God is sovereignly controlling him to do so. So he gives this example of a kingdom. Think of a kingdom that has an agenda. They've got a plan. Their agenda is to take over the, the next country over from them. So let's say that's their agenda as a, as a ruling country. They're going to do things to try to make that happen. They're not going to do things on purpose to try to hinder their efforts. And that's the, that's the argument that Jesus is trying to give here. So he gives this example of a kingdom can't be divided against itself, and a house can't be divided against itself, or they're going to fall. Then he says in verse 18, Satan also is, if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Satan has an agenda that he's trying to carry out. Now think for a second, what's Satan's agenda? To drag as many people down to hell with him as he possibly can. I think that's as clear as can be as Satan's primary agenda. How many people can he drag down with him? And he'll do anything he can to make that happen. All he's got to do is just change a certain key component of the gospel. Well, yeah, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, but you also need to do this. And you also need to do this. And so he'll take religions and he'll change them and form them into something that will lead people astray. That's what Satan does. He's the master liar. So Satan is not going to do anything to actually, intentionally, to actually further God's kingdom. And so here Jesus is doing the will of the Father, doing the will of God to further the kingdom. That's why he's performing all these miracles and proclaiming the kingdom of God and proclaiming also who he is as the Messiah. And Satan isn't going to truly be helping him do that. And so that's the point that Jesus is trying to make here. His kingdom won't stand if he's working against himself. And so he's trying to get them to see this and understand this point. He says, continuing on in verse 18, For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And he's basically saying, that's impossible. Now, not to say that Satan can't look like an angel of light and look really good and make it look like demons are being cast out, but to do what Jesus is actually doing, Satan cannot do. So he goes on to say, to further the argument, verse 19, And if I, by Beelzebul, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? So he kind of turns the table back on them, so if I'm doing it by Beelzebul, who in the world are you doing it by? This just doesn't make any sense. Um, the comment made in verse 19, by, by whom do your sons cast them out, is referring to Jewish exorcists. And, and, and you can reference this, go look back at this sometime on your own if you want, but in Acts chapter 19, there's a very interesting story in there where there's these Jewish exorcists and they see Paul being successful at casting out demons by the name of Jesus. So they get the wild idea that, oh, maybe we'll go in and we'll... And so they try it. And they try to cast out demons by the name of Jesus of whom Paul preaches. And the demon-possessed man says to them, he says, I know who Jesus is and I know who Paul is, but I don't know who you are. And he overcame them and beat them up and sent them out of the house naked. It didn't work too well for them. Obviously, they were not truly trying to cast out demons by the power of God in the name of Jesus. So these are the kind of men I think Jesus is referring to and bringing out the point as well that, you know, your exorcists aren't all that successful, by the way. And I can tell you why. And it's not because I'm casting demons out by Beelzebul and them by the Lord. It's the other way around, is what Jesus essentially is saying here. In 
And he's making the point too, that they will be your judge. In other words, can you not see the contrast between what's going on here? Verse 20. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. In other words, think about this. If I'm right and I am casting out demons by the power and the finger of God, what's going on here? Then I am the Messiah and I am doing the will of the Father. And you should hear what I have to say and stop rejecting me. So Jesus goes on to make a point. And he does it by giving an illustration starting in verse 21. So he gives this example of, he says, When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. So you can imagine a, a strong man equipped to protect his own house. Someone tries to overcome it. If that someone is not stronger than he, then he has won the battle. Um, so, when a strong man fully armed guards his own house, has, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. So in other words, what Jesus is doing now, he's giving a, a comparison between the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of darkness, and the kingdom of God, that is the kingdom of light. And in this example that Jesus gives, this illustration, we have the Satan being the strong man, guarding his house. And he's strong to a certain extent. But God is stronger. And he's going to defeat Satan, and that kingdom will not stand. We can look at several passages as Jesus being the stronger one, the one to defeat Satan, to defeat the kingdom of darkness, as that being Jesus' purpose of why he came into this world. So 1 John 3.8 says, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. For this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. If this world was left to the devil, we'd all stay in our sins, and this world would be a mess. I'm not even sure it would still be around anymore if it wasn't for God's sovereign grace and mercy in sending His Son so Jesus' primary purpose is to destroy the works of the devil. And he's going to do that by growing his kingdom on this planet, by saving hearts and souls. Hebrews 2.14 says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil that he might render powerless. Satan is powerful, but there is no comparison between the power of Satan and the power of God. In Colossians 1, 13-14 says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His Son. And Jesus is that Son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins for those who put their faith in Him. So Jesus is painting this picture of Satan is strong and he will defend himself to a certain extent, but he is nothing compared to God and God will defeat him and scatter him. And that's what's happening and that's what's going to happen finally when that day comes. So the question is, is whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Or whose side do you want to be on? Look what Jesus says. He says in verse 23, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me 
scatters. So think about this. We've got two strong men, let's just say. One's here, one's there. Whose side do you want to be on? We all know what Satan's capable of. We've seen it. We see examples of it in Scripture. We see what he's doing in the world around us and deceiving people. What about Jesus? Who is Jesus? Colossians 1, 15, 17 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created. Does this sound like just a good man to you? Sounds like a description of God, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. But talking about Jesus. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. You want to be on Satan's side? Or do you want to be on Jesus' side? Let's weigh that out. Hmm. From the standpoint of people on this earth, we all have a choice. So whose side are we going to be on? And it's not a choosing Satan's side or God's side. It's a, do we choose God and His Word and His plan for salvation? And if not, we are on Satan's side. And before God, we are on Satan's side. So it's not a, there's no room for middle ground. We don't sit here and go, well, let's see. Mm -mm, I think I'll just stay here and, and maybe my good works will, will help me somehow. No, we are on Satan's side unless we choose what God has done through sending His Son for forgiveness of sin and by placing our faith in Him, we are on His side then. So positionally, we are either on God's side and we're saved, or we're not, and therefore on Satan's side. But as Christians, whose side are we on? Do we think about that? Whose side are we on? Okay, well, I'm saved. I am on God's side. But practically speaking, how we live our lives, whose side am I on? From moment to moment throughout the day, whose side am I on? I love Galatians 5. And it says it so clearly. Because in verse 16... Paul says, through the, through the power of the Spirit, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Think about this. He doesn't say, don't walk or live according to the desires of the flesh. There's nothing wrong with that in general. We need to be thinking about those things. But he says, if you walk by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, and... You will not carry out the desires of the flesh. It sounds a lot like what Jesus said back in Luke 11.23. He who is not with me is against me. If you're not on God's side, then you're against him. Essentially what he's saying, if you're not with me, you're against me. And he who does not gather with me <clears throat> scatters. So we first need to be saved by his grace to positionally be on His side, but to practically, daily, moment by moment, be on His side, we need to be doing what's talked about in Galatians chapter 5. Walking by the Spirit, not, therefore not carrying out the desires of the flesh. And I like what Galatians 5.25 says, If we live by the Spirit, in other words, if we are positionally saved, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Practically, that's what we need to be doing. Are we walking by the Spirit? Are we walking by faith? Are we living by faith? 
Because if we're not, we're in the flesh. We're living according to the desires of our flesh, and we're living that out. And we're practically acting on Satan's side. We're doing what he wants us as believers to be doing. He wants us messing up. He can't unsave us, so he can't undo that. But he can sure mess us up and mess other people up around us. And that works towards his effort of dragging as many people to hell as he can. Because if we can look like bad Christians and we maybe mess somebody else's situation up and Satan thinks he's successful. And so he can essentially use us in that way. But we don't have to. God has given us everything we need to be able to live godly lives. And that's a promise from Scripture. And we can walk by the Spirit even when it seems impossible. So whose side are you on? Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are constantly working in our lives, Lord. And uh, I thank you that we can trust you to lead us. Lord, I pray that we would be looking to you as our leader, as our guide through life, desiring to walk by the Spirit, not fulfilling the desires of the flesh. <clears throat> Lord, we know at times it's hard. The flesh is strong, or, or in other words, we're weak, but you are strong. We thank you for that, and you can help us and give us what we need. I pray that we would desire to do that and strive for that, and you'd give us what we need to do that. I just thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.